Our first scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the Mount of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. He said, Also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is our first reading. And our second scripture reading is from the book of Acts, from the second chapter. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. This is God's word to us. Let us pray. Lord our God, we pray that you would open your word now. Speak to us here at this time. As we come before you, as we listen, open our hearts and minds to receive the truth you would have us learn so that we might understand you a little better and we might know your love. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, once upon a time, there was a cowboy. The cowboy's name was, was Jim. He worked out on the Lucas Brothers Ranch, the Triple X, out in the southeastern corner of the New Mexico Territory. One day, 16-year-old Jim was out rounding up strays with a fence-mending crew. When late in the afternoon, he noticed a dark cloud on the horizon. It, it seemed to, to rise straight up. Jim rode closer, tied his horse, and hiked over toward the cloud. Suddenly, he said, I was looking at the deepest, darkest hole I ever saw, and the smoke was bats, millions of them, coming out of that hole. He came back a few days later with some rope and a lantern, and what he discovered there in the Chihuahua Desert was an amazing cave that went on and on underground. Jim was Jim White, the discoverer of Car Carlsbad Caverns. His story is fascinating. Other ranch hands knew about the hole in the ground, but Jim paid attention. He noticed the cloud. Others had seen it before, but he was the one who decided to check it out. And when he did, Jim White discovered not only a cave but also another way of life called bat guano. I'm not kidding. A wealthy businessman came along and invested in guano mining. It was used for fertilizer. He put Jim in charge. It's estimated that over the next 20 years, around 100,000 tons of the stuff was taken out of Carlsbad Caverns at around $90 a ton. Over $2,700 a ton in today's dollars. 2,700 times 100,000? You do the math. Jim White became rich. But more than that, it gave Jim a chance to explore the cave he had found. He'd show it to others, taking them down in the guano bucket. 
It eventually got the attention of the U.S. government. And in 1923, 25 years after Jim White first noticed that cloud on the horizon, President Calvin Coolidge signed a proclamation establishing Carlsbad Cave National Monument. Jim White's story has some parallels with the story of Moses in our scripture reading in Exodus. Both worked for somebody else. Moses worked for his father-in-law, Jethro. And both Jim and Moses worked with animals, but with Jim it was cows and horses. Moses was a sheep man, which is what he was doing when he noticed the burning bush. There was a bit of an age difference, too. Jim was a teenager, and Moses was a little older, around 80 years old. But the main similarity between the two, the thing they had most in common, both Moses and Jim White noticed. They paid attention, and then they did something about it. They saw something different in the midst of their daily routines, their day-to-day lives, God got Jim's and Moses' attention. And whenever God gets your attention and you respond to him, it changes your life. God changes your life. And God used them both to do good. In the Bible, it seems to be water or fire when God wants to get people's attention. A long time before Moses came on the scene, way back in Genesis, God flooded the whole planet, destroying just about everything because of the great evil that had taken root. You may recall the story of how the Lord told Noah to build an ark and spared Noah and his family. Then later God inspired John the Baptist to use water, water from the Jordan River when he baptized people there. And again, it was about evil in people's lives. But this water was about repentance, turning from evil. As John prepared the way for the coming of Jesus. Then when John baptized Jesus himself, the Lord transformed the water and the sacrament of baptism into a sign of God's grace. God still requires repentance, but the baptism of Jesus demonstrated that the waters of baptism represent God's gift of grace, available to all people of all ages, not some decision on our part. It's a symbol of God's great love for us. And then fire. The Old Testament fire, where evil was concerned, is in the destruction of the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But not only in dealing with evil. God used fire as a method of communication to Moses in the burning bush. God spoke through this fire in a powerful way because he had a mission, a great task for Moses to do. And in the New Testament, the fire we celebrate today on the day of Pentecost, let's take a closer look at that story. After Jesus had been raised from the dead, as he appeared to his followers several times, he told them not to leave Jerusalem, where they all were. Jerusalem, where they had come together for the Passover feast, where Jesus had been put on trial and killed on the cross. But the risen Jesus told them to stay put. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody comes back from the dead and tells me to do something, I'm probably going to listen. And they did, for the most part, except for that fishing trip. The one in John's Gospel. Remember that one? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. The message I called, The Language of Forever. It's interesting. The distance from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee, which is the closest fishing hole to Jerusalem, is about 75 miles. About a three-day hike each way. So they were gone from Jerusalem for a good week, maybe longer. But on this fishing trip, Jesus made one of his post-resurrection appearances to his followers. And when he saw them, Jesus didn't scold or reprimand them for not following orders. Instead, he had a conversation 
with Peter. You may recall. It was about taking care of others. The way Jesus put it to Peter, he said, feed my sheep. But except for that fishing excursion, his followers did obey Jesus' orders to stay put, as far as we know. And 50 days later, 50 days after Passover, found them all together in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost for the Jewish feast known as Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks. It marks the wheat harvest, but more importantly, Shavuot also commemorates when the Lord gave the law of Moses, the Torah, to the people of Israel, and that's significant, because it was a pivotal event in the life of God's people Israel. And since there are no coincidences with God, it's significant that the Lord chose this day to manifest his Holy Spirit among Jesus' followers, just as Jesus promised. It's significant, too, that they were all together in one place, as we just read. Notice it does not say they were all in solitude and silent prayer when the Holy Spirit came. No, they were all together in one place. Why? So that people would see it. Earlier, before Jesus was taken up into heaven, he had also commanded them to go and teach all nations, spread the gospel, tell the good news of Jesus Christ, because following him is not a private thing. It's a social thing, a public thing, which may present a challenge in time of social distancing, but good news is something to be shared. So when God's Holy Spirit was manifested, it was when others were around who could see it. And that's when the fire happened. Not a burning bush, but the tongues of fire that Luke describes here in Acts 2. Acts, that's short for Acts of the Apostles. Not only the tongues of fire, but also the mighty wind. That's when the church was born. The Holy Spirit was manifested in their hearts, in their lives. One more important detail, they were not at church. They were not in the temple, not in a synagogue, but out. All in one place, yes, but out in the world. Like Jim White, like Moses. They were out there living their lives, following Jesus as best they could under the circumstances. And when it happened... They were not sequestered somewhere apart from the real world. Then the tongues of fire and the wind, suddenly they began speaking in foreign languages. Have you ever been in a place where they don't speak your language and then hear your language spoken? It gets your attention. It got the attention of those in Jerusalem for the feast. Folks from Egypt and North Africa, from Macedonia, what we call Turkey today, Maybe they understood Hebrew and Aramaic, but it wasn't their language. Suddenly, after this, this freight train sound around the corner that they heard, they zeroed in on somebody speaking their own language. The Holy Spirit did that. And what were they saying? They were just telling the story of Jesus. The listeners were amazed. They didn't know what to say. Others, though, maybe local folks who didn't understand the foreign languages, said they're drunk. Isn't that just like somebody who doesn't know what's going on? To become judgmental about it or say something derogatory. It's what can happen when you experience something outside your comfort zone. But Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, it says, stood up and address the crowd that had gathered. I'll paraphrase what he said. Okay, oh, you local people from Judea and Jerusalem, listen up, these men aren't drunk. It's only nine in the morning. But this is what Jesus promised would happen. And then Peter went on to tell the story of Jesus, how God sent him to show the way, but how he had been rejected and killed by the very people he was sent to save. When they heard Peter tell the story, they were upset. They understood that the kingdom of God had come near 
and they had missed it. What can we do, they cried. Repent and be baptized, Peter answered. Turn around from the path you've been on and turn back to God, turn to Jesus. And that's just what they did. About 3,000 people joined the church that day, that first Pentecost. It's every preacher's dream, I guess, except maybe Billy Graham. Once again, God used fire and water. The waters of baptism to get people's attention on that first Pentecost. He also used wind, living here on the plains. So I can appreciate that. But we can get hung up on what each of these things mean. We can argue over the supposedly correct way to baptize, to dunk or not to dunk. We can disagree over the speaking of tongues thing, what it means, whether it's necessary or needed or appropriate today. It's interesting, I never hear anybody say that if the Holy Spirit was really present in our churches, that the mighty wind would show up and come blowing into churches whenever we get together. That's because we can't control the wind. But the thing is, the devil wants us to disagree on those things. What we need to be asking is questions. Questions of ourselves. Like, am I tuned into the Spirit? Do I hear the voice of God, the voice of Jesus in my life? And if the answer is no, then why not? Is Jesus Christ so important to me that I tell others, as Peter did, when the occasion presents itself, we need to ask those questions on Pentecost Sunday, but also on Monday morning, on Saturday night, every day, when we are out in the world. I think the same spirit, the same attitude can and should apply to our lives today. When we face things like this coronavirus pandemic, or when we face things like the senseless violence of a bad cop, or the misdirected violence against innocent citizens, businesses, and neighborhoods. We need to ask, where is God in all this, and how should we respond? What is the message the Holy Spirit has for us in all this? How should we move forward in the way we treat other people? How should we move forward as we reopen our businesses and churches, reopen our country? Do we listen to our own voices, opinions, our weary wants and desires? Or are we listening to the Spirit's call on our lives? Because it's a joyous thing. It's a hopeful thing. The voice of God's Holy Spirit is eternal. It lasts forever. The love of God, our God, the power of His Holy Spirit have been around forever and will be here long after this pandemic has been conquered, long after justice has been served and our cities have been rebuilt, because it is through the Spirit's power that all these things will happen. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God is the Spirit of God's love. And it's the most powerful force in the universe. It cannot be defeated. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is proof of that. You know, the U.S. military has a bomb called the GBU-43B. But it's called by an acronym, MOAB, which stands for Massive Ordnance Airburst, or if you prefer, the mother of all bombs. It's the largest non-nuclear bomb in the Air Force arsenal. Weighing over 21,000 pounds, it is the equivalent to 11 tons of TNT. The Moab was used against ISIS in Afghanistan. And of course, I used it in this morning's sermon title, which can be a little tricky using military ordinance when you're talking about God's love and the grace of Jesus Christ. But the fiery impact of that first Pentecost was and is greater still than any Moab or even a nuclear device because its effect was worldwide and eternal for all times. You know, Jesus' followers were dealt a heavy blow when he was crucified. They didn't know what to do. 
They hunkered down at first, fearful of the unknown. But when the Holy Spirit came and was manifested as Jesus promised, they were changed. No longer were they afraid. They were no longer tentative and unsure because they had a guide, a clear voice, God's voice. And they were tuned in and listening. They still faced hardships. And there were those who tried to shut them up. There were those who tried to shut them down, but they weren't afraid anymore. My father suffered from Parkinson's disease for about the last 10 years of his life. There's a picture of us there together. You've heard me talk about him before. Bob Wiley was a World War II and Korea veteran. He was an elder in the Presbyterian Church. I remember sharing some challenges in ministry with my dad, difficulties I was going through, and when he had the Parkinson's, he would usually just listen. It was good for me just to get it out. But on this particular occasion... I mentioned to Dad, I said, it's kind of like a baptism by fire. And just for a moment, his eyes blazed like they used to when I was in trouble as a kid. Yes, but it's a refining fire, he said. That's what the fire of the Holy Spirit does. It refines. So on Pentecost Day, 2020, In the midst of these challenging times, we celebrate a birthday, the birthday of the church. Birthdays are about moving forward, you know, remembering that Jesus calls you and me to be the church. I challenge you to notice when you feel that refining fire, like Jim White did, like Moses, like those early believers, and then respond as they did. Don't listen to the fears and the questions that seek to divide us. Listen to the spirit of the one who says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I have overcome the world. That would be Jesus Christ. The spirit is calling us today. The spirit of love and power, God's power. Let him use you to share his love. So that through you, the world will be a better place.